I spent quite a lot, lot of my youth growing up on a farm. No connection to the ocean at all. We were landlocked, it was inland. The neighbours didn't even know what the ocean looked like, I think. So when I was about eight, I think, eight or nine, I picked up a lot of matchsticks and ice cream sticks. And I just started building an, a galleon. But I didn't have a picture to copy. I'd never even seen a an old boat from the 1700s, like a, a tall ship. So somehow I, I felt connected with this expanse of water that I'd never even been to. All I'd seen was a lake in my life. And then teenager, when I was a teenager, I was living, basically living on the beach. We had a house near the beach in South Africa in a small village, and I was surfing every day, spearfishing as much as I could, diving, jumping off the rocks, spending as much time as I could in the sea and on the beach. I didn't want to go anywhere else, I didn't want to do anything else, I just wanted to be in the water. So we ended up backpacking to, to Indonesia and on this trip I met the owner of a yacht surfing and subsequently I got a job on that boat, first as a boat boy just helping out on the boat, working for free and then I became the captain on that surf charter yacht in Indonesia. So I'd flown back from the yacht, I left the yacht in Thailand, finished the Sumatra surf season, flew back to South Africa to meet the owner of the yacht and I ended up going out partying with a whole crew of the workers who worked for the, for the boss. And I met a girl who also worked on yachts in the bar, in the pub. We were driving back to get my bags because I was actually on the way to the airport early in the morning, so at about two o'clock in the morning. And the doctor sort of stood over me and the first words he said to me, the first words that came out of his mouth were, son, I shoot from the hip, you're paralyzed and you'll never walk again. He didn't introduce himself, he didn't tell me where I was. Those were the first things he said. I didn't even know he was the doctor. I didn't believe them. Because actually through life I'd always done my own thing. Whenever somebody said you can't do it, I just went out and I did it. When I left the rehabilitation center and entered the real world, then I realized how stuck I was on land in a wheelchair. But that started the long, slow trip to depression. Without realizing it, I came to the edge of that depression pit and then I slipped in there. But I do know that he went through thoughts of suicide 
that's it. Nobody ever said to me, you can still do the things you did, but do it differently. Everybody said, no, you can't do the things you did before. And then I went down that dark, dark road of self-destruction. I don't know, it must be about five Mexican guys. And I'd been complaining through the night. Whining, basically. I'd been whining. Hey, gringo, I'm tired of your whining. And that's when he took out this huge revolver, took out all the bullets, put one bullet into the chamber, spun it, pushed the gun over to me, and he said, you want to kill yourself? Go ahead. Try. And I had a little grin on my face. I remember I had a little grin, and I pulled the trigger. And it just went click. So after I'd pulled the trigger of that gun and nothing happened, it actually, I proved to myself that I could actually go through with suicide. And I just figured that drowning would be easy and I would leave this life doing what I loved, either in the surf or in the flat water or just in any water. So I paddled out to where there were no waves. I threw myself off the board and, and thought I would just sink to the bottom, but I didn't. I just bobbed around on the surface. And I was, as hard as I tried, I couldn't swim down. So my ass was sticking out the water like a cork. But now I was angry because I couldn't drown in flat water. So I decided to climb back on the surfboard and paddle to where the waves were because I knew that one of those waves on the head would definitely finish me. Because I was really weak, I weighed, I was very, I'd lost a lot of weight. I was white and skinny and soulless. But I actually couldn't get past these small foamies that were coming through. They kept knocking me off the board and pushing me back, which made me more and more angry. Because I had my plan, and my plan was to drown. And no one was going to stop me from my plan. The small foamy came through, probably 20, 20 centimeters high. Nothing like the huge waves I'd been surfing before. And that pushed me. It, it somehow pushed me to the side and turned me towards the shore. And I ended up riding this wave all the way to the shore, a little bit confused. But something rebooted in my system. As I, as I was going on that board, and I was watching the water move underneath me, and I felt the feeling of surfing, something happened. And I don't quite know what it is, but somehow I reconnected with the ocean on a level that was really, really deep and really, really powerful. I started getting stronger, I got browner, my hair grew, I became more healthy. I met a beautiful girl on the beach who then wanted to be with me and not with all these other strapping, bronzed, amazing surfers that were strutting around with all their muscles bulging. And the ocean is such a passive medium that it built my muscles without shocking my body. So it became much easier to climb into my wheelchair. It became easier to climb from the wheelchair into, onto the bed, even from the floor onto my wheelchair. With the physical strength came the mental strength and then the spiritual strength. I felt that somehow the water had raised my vibration, physically as well as mentally, and that with this raising of my vibration, it raised my thought pattern and raising my positivity of my thought pattern then attracted into my life positive events which led me to meet positive people which led me to having positive outcomes of whatever I decided to do. And these were small victories, small little victories every day, which then culminated in that big one of crossing the ocean on a yacht. At some point he decided to start a whole new boat venture uh, because he is a fish and he needs to be on the ocean or in the ocean. Uh, he said to me, you know, James, uh, can you 
would you like to maybe come and help me sail this boat all the way to, to Thailand? He's doing what he, he loves to do. He sails with friends. He sees the ocean. He looks for treasure or adventures or whatever. But that's what he loves to do. And if that's the end of life, let it be. us the highlights were when we get to a place and we anchor and we can go surf and spearfish and, and, and you know and, and, and do things in the water that's what we liked about the whole trip It's got a surfboard, it's got some straps on the side that you can hold on to. And um, yeah, and he just goes, he paddles like this, gets on a wave and he surfs it and he surfs it really well. He gets barreled and you know, it's, it's, it's cooking and he loves it. And um, you know, that's the, the first time that I saw Bruno really come into his own, like surfing and just seeing how much <laughs> him catching a wave just makes his life perfect. We were sailing without the high-tech equipment. We didn't have all the fancy gadgets. We went with a bag of rice, bags of onions, bags of garlic, spear guns, and we were gonna live off the ocean. And we did, we lived off the ocean. So we crossed the, we crossed the Indian Ocean through thick and thin, big storms, nearly sank, um, with no money, and we anchored in Thailand, and James flew home to spend time with his family for Christmas and that's when I got hit by the tsunami alone on the yacht. If I show you on my computer I've got a picture of of me and my boat going over the, the third wave which is a six meter wave. It's a complete miracle that I survived that tsunami or that set of four waves and I realized that the ocean wasn't out to get me because up until that point I was still slightly fearful of the ocean I didn't want to die now that I'd been surfing I realized I didn't really want to die because it was quite fun but I was still I had a slight fear factor because physically I wasn't as strong as I was before and I I thought I would never surf the same waves I surfed before but after the tsunami something happened to me my my fear levels my fear limits I should say rose to another level which got me to the point where I am now where I can surf big waves fearlessly and safely and basically the same waves that I surfed before I broke my back James flew back another good friend Alex joined us on the boat and we sailed down Sumatra, across Java and onto Bali where I met Mario for the first time in eight years who knew me before I broke my back from when I was skippering the yacht 
and that he had a nice anchorage for me in front of his beach club and that's how I ended up in Bali and one le thing led to another and my life began in Bali I, I started having a Bali life spending a lot of time here and meeting amazing people who then pushed me in my own way to go surfing more and more and to spend more time in the ocean even though I'd been living on a yacht for a year there's a lot of the time you don't spend in the ocean, you're, you're on the ocean because you're sailing and you're trying to get from one island to the next. I knew the yacht was safe in a, in a harbour, in the marina. And a really good friend, Cookie, kindly let me stay in his, in his villa. And I just went surfing every single day. Um, I met Cookie at this surf spot that we call the Widows. Why we call it the Widows is, um, you know, it was a very uh, long and winding road to get there, but the last village that you had to turn off to get down to the beach, there was always this black widow, like this woman in black clothes standing around. So it ended up, for us, it ended up being the Widows. Other people call it other, other names. That was um, where I met this, this guy called Bruno. He was um, crawling over the rocks there. It's not an easy place to get to if you're in a wheelchair, I can tell you that. Meeting a great person like Cookie who's just so generous and giving and, um, and always up for taking me surfing in these inaccessible, inhospitable places with, uh, with his son Josh. And the access is quite difficult there. Cookie has to pull me down the beach in my homemade wheelchair with three wheels. And it's quite demanding on, on me and for my friends at times around me, as in being pulled across a long beach, across the hot black sand, just getting through the shore break where I just keep getting washed back up the beach.
I don't try and be the big tough guy when I'm washed up from a shore break that's bigger than I am. Girls actually look a lot deeper than the physical aspect of a guy. And time and time again it shows to me that the physical is a very minute part of who we are in this world. It's who we are inside, it's how we grow as beings of energy. When I'm on land I feel heavy, I'm constrained, it's difficult to get around. I feel held back. I deal with it with, in my mind. It's made me mentally strong, so I'm thankful. Wherever I am in the world, if I'm on terra firma, everything is a challenge. Everybody in life has their cross to bear. I understand that. Mine is a physical challenge every single day. From the minute I wake up in the morning, I'm only thinking about my body keeping it healthy, making sure I don't damage myself without knowing it, which then can lead to infections, which can then stop me from doing what I love to do. Because we live in a physical world, I'm physically challenged every single day. It takes me a lot longer to do a 10 second job than an upright. The feeling when I enter the water, it's of complete freedom. It's become a habit, a subconscious habit, but whenever I go into the water, the first thing I do is I put my head under the water and I just feel that energy enveloping me, which is almost transfers into an inner feeling of me becoming one with the water. Our bodies are made up of 75% water. I'm not sure on the scientific terms, but it's something like that. I try to become as one with the ocean, with the dam, with the river, any kind of water and any medium that I'm in. And that separates me from the constraints of a wheelchair and allows me to feel the freedom of weightlessness. One way of meeting beautiful girls is by crawling along the beach sand and asking them for a bit of help, <laughs> which often I need. 
So I don't sometimes want to drag my surfboard over the rocks. From being in a chair and thinking in a certain way and becoming more in tune with the spiritual side to life, not just the physical and the mental, has attracted into my life people of a certain spiritual nature. Meeting people like Xavier and going on now on a friend's boat where all of a sudden I'm not the captain and where someone else is the captain and it allows me to relax a lot more and um, I end up steering someone else's boat which reminds me of the big trip that I did through the ocean and spent years on on one boat but it was always slightly stressful when it was my venture by being on someone else's yacht it allowed me to to really be free in experiencing the surf, the diving, and in a, in a way where I could not worry about the boat. So we went from some island south of the Philippines to Rajampat where there's some amazing diving and we dived with manta rays and all sorts of different sea life and just hanging out with friends and we were able to play chess, we fooled around, a bunch of mates. I can remember teaching one friend how to, how to scuba dive. So here, all of a sudden, we're all at the same level again in the water. And whereas normally, all my friends have been helping me or doing things for me, now all of a sudden, I could do something 
for someone else where I was teaching them how to scuba dive because I've taught diving so much in my past and I find it so easy. And uh, meeting Simon, the parkour specialist, and uh, challenging him to climb into my wheelchair with his legs tied up. Now we've got Simon, the parkour specialist, <laughs> trying to get into my chair. Okay, off the floor, the same way I do it, no assistance. And then him struggling to get into my wheelchair. He does some amazing somersaults and does amazing things with his body and jumping over buildings and that was really interesting to watch because it showed how the human body can adapt, how I find it so effortless to climb into my wheelchair from the floor and he battled to do it. So it was, a, it was another small lesson to me where I could see how the body develops to situations, how the mind develops to situations and so does our spirit develop to situations that we are in. Semangat walaupun dia tidak bisa jalan, tapi dia punya semangat. Ya luar biasa. Kala seperti orang-orang kita mungkin. Ya saya pikir begitu. Meeting the the crew of Lombo, the Indonesian captain and all his deckhands was an experience because I think it was the first time they had seen someone in a wheelchair come onto a yacht. And over the next few days they realized that I actually knew what I was doing. I knew how to tie the knots, I could climb on and off the boat, I could go surfing. They, they have a more fatalistic way of looking at life so that if you do have something wrong with you in any physical sense, you resign yourself to fate and to stay home and to, to not push the limits, not push yourself. And I think it was a, they were quite surprised at how I managed to or was trying to keep up with all the other guys. When I first climbed on the boat, they were a little bit concerned about me and really tried to help me in every which way because they were extremely generous, nice, friendly people. And over the few weeks, I felt a huge change in their attitude toward me where they sort of forgot about the wheelchair, which was quite interesting for me to watch their journey of watching me being in the wheelchair on a yacht. Oh, kalau untuk Indonesia mungkin saya pikir jarang sudah orang seperti dia yang semangat kuat seperti itu. Tidak pernah punya teman seperti Bruno. Tapi sekarang punya dia Bruno. <laughs> well, so being on the yacht, or on any boat, means that the wheelchair is not used very much. People are either sitting, or walking very short distances, or swimming. So all of a sudden, the wheelchair falls away from people's viewpoints. So their awareness of me sitting in a wheelchair is lowered. And so all of a sudden, I'm just Bruno the guy sitting on a couch. I'm not Bruno the guy in a wheelchair. And there's a sense of freedom in that for me. And from a psychological point of view, I, can, I find that people treat me slightly differently when I'm in the water or not in the wheelchair. Not in a good or a bad way, just different. I think it's important to keep humor as an upright towards someone who's in a wheelchair, to one of the legless. Because discrimination creeps in when you don't joke with someone who's legless because as an upright you feel slightly guilty that you've got legs and I don't. So, the best thing an upright can do is to take a legless guy and physically throw him out of his wheelchair into the water, like my friends do. My friends are throwing out my chair all the time. They think it's hilarious. And this comes from not a lack of compassion. It comes from complete acceptance. But it also boils down to that person in a chair making people feel accepted. So it doesn't matter if you're an angry guy in a wheelchair. Find the humor or find your passion. Yeah, I don't want people to feel sorry for me because I'm in a wheelchair. I have such an amazing life. It's nice that people have compassion and are always willing to help. But the sense of freedom now doesn't come from the physical constraints. Now the physical freedom comes from the mental clarity 
and the, the peace that we as humans can get from dealing with a situation that we are in in a manner where we use the medium or we use what we can. For me it's the ocean. I've used the ocean and the water to help me with a sense of freedom. But in, in all walks of life we can find that freedom in whatever or wherever our passion lies. I've got this amazing friend called Johnny who's quadriplegic. He can't use his hands properly. Johnny's found his zone with art. He draws and paints the most incredible pictures. I call him Clawfinger because of his art. His art is my ocean. I asked him if this was a photograph and he looked at me all strange and said, Hanson, that's King Kong and a T-Rex. How can that be a photograph? <laughs> um, well, I got a call from a nurse from the spinal unit um, saying that there was a, a new patient in there who kind of likes the ocean, likes um, surfing and things like that. And they knew that I was kind of into some of that stuff. So um, they asked if I could come and talk to him because um, he was new to a new injury and everything. Uh, so I came over there and um, uh, immediately when I came into the hospital I saw he had a big blue poster up, the film The Big Blue, and um, I loved that film, so I thought, ah, I could probably going to get on with this guy. Yeah, I mean, I think for both for Bruno and I, we're quite, obviously quite active people before, um, so it's a huge change, and you don't really know... I guess you've always seen people in chairs before, but you don't really know what, what, what's involved. And, and uh, so it's quite easy to think, oh, my life's over. Uh, you know, I can't do what I love doing. Uh, that's why it's important to meet people who are, who've been injured for a while, who, who are perhaps active. And, um, and I think he was, yeah, he was pretty in, in a bit of a bad way at the beginning, which, which all of us um, probably felt the same thing. He'd always have amazing stories to tell, you know, like he'd, what he'd been through. He always pulls through it, through it, and he, it never scares him. Yet. Well, I mean, it scares him at the time, but it never puts him off doing more. Because in, in his mind, he knows he can do it, and, and he won't give up. So, and I guess the mind's more powerful than the body, really, at times. So, I mean, it would, you know, people completely physically able would probably scare the pants off them and they'd never do it again but uh, with him he just seems to want to want to do it more when he goes through these scary events and uh, yeah yeah it works well it's a good partnership you know when we go away um, I can always guarantee there'll be an adventure to be had you know Bruno seems to ad attract adventure no matter where we are um, and we just we just enjoy it the Indiana Jones on wheels. <laughs> yeah, totally. I think that's... that's. <laughs> I think often it's a good indicator with people like Kat is because it's not just adults that they inspire, you know. You know, my daughter's always asking me about Bruno. She remembers him you know, coming to visit and he stayed in the camper van up on the hill on our land and for years after that, where's Bruno? Is he walking? What, what's he doing? Has he got a yacht, you know? And then I remember one day she actually said to me, Dad, is, is Bruno a pirate? <laughs> and I sort of thought about it. I went, yeah, I think he's a bit of a pirate, you know. <laughs> After the accident, I gave more allowances. He could be what he wanted to be. And um, our relationship actually improved. We became very, very good friends. There are three things Bruno needs still to learn in life. One, how to cook. Two, how to learn to be, not only to do, because we are human beings, we are not human doings. He needs to learn how to be, calm, still, meditate. And the next thing is he needs a very nice wife. <laughs> <laughs> So in my devotion to life now, I've proved to myself and to others that life doesn't have to stop because you're paralyzed. Everybody's got some kind of 
outlet or some kind of passion, some kind of road that they can walk, no matter if they're in a wheelchair or can't use their hands. The ocean made me who I am. It's molded me into the, to the creature that I've become. It is only because of the ocean, from a personal sense, that I'm still alive. Nothing did for me what the ocean did for me in 30 seconds and then from then on to and every day I learn more and more in the ocean every day I feel more in tune with the ocean every day I feel more at one with the ocean